All right, so welcome everyone and thank you for being here. Um, welcome to today's uh, members call on the Citizens Broadband Radio Service or CBRS. My name is Kat Blake and I'm the Policy and Program Manager at Next Century Cities. So a few quick housekeeping details before we begin. Um, first is that we're asking everyone to remain on mute so that we can reduce the impact of background noise. Um, for example, you may hear a fire truck going through my window. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, so if you could remain on mute, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, second of all, if you have any questions, which we definitely encourage, um, please type them in the chat box located on the bottom right hand of your screen. You can send them either to the whole group or to just the organizers, and we'll be sure that they're addressed throughout the call. And finally, just a heads up that this webinar will be recorded and shared both on our YouTube page and our resource page on nextcenturycities.org. Um, so if you want to refer back to it or share it with others, you will definitely have the chance to do so. Um, all right. So quickly before we get started, I have a quick side note, um, which is that I'd like to remind everyone that we are still running the mobile only challenge. And if you would like to participate, you can find more information at mobileonlychallenge.com. Um, so back on track and prior to handing off to Chris Mitchell, who is moderating today, um, I'd like to just share a little bit of background information about CBRS and why we're here. So last fall, the FCC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking on CBRS. And we were concerned that a change in the rules would have the potential to exasperate the digital divide between rural and urban America. Um, so the current CBRS rules can really encourage the type of innovative spectrum solutions that cities and towns need to encourage innovation and broadband adoption. So this is why we've been working with the Wi-Fi Forward Coalition to draft a letter that local officials can sign on to. So this letter will then be sent to the FCC with as many of your signatures as possible. Um, so joining us today are some folks who can help to explain what CBRS is, why it matters, and why you should consider signing on to this letter to the FCC. Um, based on the email we sent out on Monday, we already have five signatories, but the more the better. Um, let's see here. All right, so to introduce our presenters for the day, um, joining us, we have Ellen Satterwhite, the Vice President of the Glen Echo Group and the Spokeswoman for Wi-Fi Forward. Um, we also have with us Jimmy Carr, the Chief Executive Officer of All Points Broadband and the Board of Directors and Legislative Committee Chairman um, for the Wireless ISP Association. And our moderator today is Chris Mitchell, who is the Policy Director for Next Century Cities. So with that, I will turn it over to Chris and we can go ahead and get started. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to have uh, an interesting approach today um, in which I think uh, Jimmy will do a lot of the heavy lifting of explaining some of the, the technical stuff, some of the background, and I'll be interrupting him periodically so that Ellen and I can um, add a few extra points and that sort of thing. Uh, we'll take questions at any point. Feel free to start entering them into the chat box. Uh, you can send them out to everyone if you wish or just send them to the organizers or the presenters and we will do our best to uh, get to them as quickly as we can. Um, and I think the best way to start is to look at what's at stake, which is our next slide. And Jimmy, I think uh, you'll get started with that and then we'll fill in a couple of gaps after you start that off. Great, well, uh, thank you, Chris, and, and thank you to Next Century Cities for convening this webinar on a hugely important topic for you, the communities you serve uh, and represent that has gotten surprisingly little attention given what's at stake. Um, so today we're gonna go a little bit into the weeds, so just to kind of understand the implications of this, but in broad strokes, um, we have a spectrum band <coughs> that, um, for which the FCC unanimously ad adopted rules in 2015, uh, that because of the characteristics of the band and also the way that the spectrum, these are public airwaves would be auctioned, uh, presents really unique promise for um, in urban and suburban areas providing a wireless based broadband alternative to provide competition where there is none today. Um, it's also a way in rural areas of encouraging small businesses and new entrants to invest in providing additional broadband in rural areas. 
Uh, and it's a spectrum paradigm that will ensure um, US-based innovation and America's continued global leadership in uh, the way that you know, wireless technology is developed and spectrum is allocated. Um, starting last summer, the, uh, the big four dominant mobile carriers, uh, who you know, uh, filed a petition at the Federal Communications Commission to have those rules that were unanimously adopted in 2015 changed. Uh, in fundamental ways that really will benefit only the mobile use case to the detriment of all other users and uh, we think innovation and most importantly rural broadband. Um, and so, it, you know, I, as I think the, uh, the folks from Next Century Cities and Chris and others are going to explain, um, now is really the time to speak up uh, if you care about broadband and innovation and competition uh, for you and your constituents. Next slide. And I think um, just before we get into the explanation, Ellen, you were going to offer um, a brief look ahead to uh, what people will be able to do at the end of the uh, conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. I thought, oh, oh, I didn't jump in. Um, <laughs> so as Kat mentioned at the beginning, um, we've been working with many thanks to Next Century Cities to put together a letter um, so that the FCC can hear from a breadth of voices. The FCC, I, I suspect many of you have signed letters and, and sent reply comments because you're interested and involved in these issues, and so you understand uh, what an impact your voice can have. And, and especially on this issue, we believe it's very important to show the FCC what the future could look like in terms of innovation and investment and entities impacted, versus the, the status quo and making changes that really prioritize the needs always happy to talk to anybody about it and we have a link um, at the end of the presentation that you can take a look at thank you and now um, we're going to continue just with uh, um, some background on what the spectrum is so you can start to get a sense, but um, to reiterate one of the key points, um, this is important spectrum and these rules, it's, it's kind of the end of the um, last big chunks of spectrum that'll be usable in many ways. So um, this isn't the kind of thing where you can just sort of sit it out and hope that you'll be involved the next time around. This is a, um, this is a very key moment in time and it's one in which, as Jimmy said, too few people are paying attention to, which means that you weighing in will make a bigger difference than ordinary. Um, so please, Jimmy, continue. Yeah. Um, so let me build on what Chris mentioned there about why this is so important and, and a little bit of uh, physics is necessary, I think, to understand the background. So, you know, the, the FCC is, con is in charge of controlling who gets to use the public airwaves, which, you know, spectrum. Um, and the different slices of the airwaves have different characteristics. And so there are certain airwaves that are known as low band. Um, and there are uh, benefits and detriments to using low band spectrum. Uh, the, the primary benefit of low band spectrum is it can get through a lot of obstacles, walls, trees, et cetera, um, but it's limited in how much data it can carry. So that's the fundamental trade off. So a good example of low band spectrum is the old over the air broadcast TV. If you think about that, you could have an antenna up in rural America and, and be in a in the middle of a pine forest or on the far side of the mountain, but the spectrum would, you could still get broadcast television. Another example is a lot of mobile carriers will use low band spectrum um, so that you could be talking on your cell phone when you're in the basement. At the other end of the spectrum uh, table, we have so-called high band spectrum. Um, and this is kind of the inverse of low band. It can carry a whole lot of data, um, but it really can't get through any obstructions. So you know, depending on how high you are on the spectrum table, a few leaves between the tower or other broadcast location and the receiver um, will block the signal. So, you know, a good household example of high band spectrum or spectrum at least that has those characteristics is the signals from your remote. You can't stand in one room and point through a wall or two at your TV and control it because this, that spectrum is blocked. The spectrum we're talking about today um, and why it is so important um, is what's known as mid-band spectrum, and some people refer to it as the, the Goldilocks lock spectrum. It's not too high, not too low. And the, the really important aspect of the spectrum is that it gets enough data uh, 
to deliver what an end user is going to expect for a residential or commercial broadband connection for now and for the years to come. And it also can penetrate some trees and walls, but not as many. Uh, and that's why mid-band spectrum is so important. And this, the CBRS spectrum we're talking about today is the 150 megahertz between 3550 and 3700. It's mid-band spectrum. And significantly, it is the only mid-band spectrum that we can expect to be made available for commercial purposes for the seeable future. So this is really a, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of spectrum is finite. And this is the only slice in the mid-band that's going to be available anytime soon for providing rural broadband and for providing competitive broadband in, in urban and suburban areas, and, and that's why this is such an important proceeding. Uh, next and slide. so just to, just to to be very clear, you know, many of the, the people who are in the um, audience, um, you know, there's radio that's appropriate for police and fire and public safety type stuff. This is very specifically um, technology that would allow uh, additional competition for everyone in your community, for residents, for businesses, et cetera. And um, just want to be very clear with that because sometimes we're talking about um, uh, broadband over wireless for different kinds of audiences. But this is something where when we get the rules right, we can encourage um, choice um, or encourage lower cost deployments to rural areas where there's nothing available today. Yeah, Chris, that's a great point and something that maybe I ran over too quickly. Um, you know, fixed wireless, the technology that our industry uses is really an access technology of the future. I mean, this is our manufacturers are designing products and their core market is not the United States. It's the two thirds of the world's population who've never received their telecommunications from a wire and never will. And in the U.S., we benefit from all that innovation. Um, and so, you know, in, a, in an urban or suburban area, you know, in your city today, you might have one in dominant incumbent provider. Say you, you have a provider who's got an aging DSL plant. And the service isn't very good, but they don't have competition. Or you've got, you know, a cable uh, operator who, again, is, has a, an effective monopoly and not a lot of competition and not a lot of incentive to invest. If this spectrum we're talking about today, the CBRS spectrum, is made available for new entrants and competitors in the broadband space, um, then, you know, your existing cable uh, or DSL incumbent uh, would all of a sudden be in a position where it could have competition from a fixed wireless op operator who could offer higher quality speeds at lower cost, uh, and and that would benefit your community and, and provide competition in broadband, which is really so important. Um, turning to, to what's so innovative about the current rules, let's go to the next slide. Um, and again, I'll, I'll try and limit the physics to the, the bare necessity, bare necessity, but. Um, the spectrum we're talking about uh, made an exclusive right to use a spectrum band available. It's been done um, uh, that that user has the exclusive right to use that spectrum over a wide geographic area, whether or not they're actually using it all the time. And uh, to put more spectrum into commercial use, um, the federal government has begun looking through its inventory of what's being used by the federal government and figuring out ways that that spectrum can be used more efficiently. And the CBRS band is an example of that. So um, there's a three-tiered structure that has been set up for this band um, that it's really important to understand what's so innovative and, and interesting about this band. So um, this spectrum is currently used by military radar systems on the ship, on ships along the coast. Um, and it's super important that the military have the ability to use this radar to look for um, enemy vessels and submarines and um, you know aircraft coming to attack the homeland. Um, but in fact, the, the military is only using this spectrum very, very sporadically. And so, uh, and these probably aren't the exact numbers, but if you think about it, you know, the, the Navy is only pinging for uh, enemy vessels, you know, for five or 10 seconds a day, maybe. And so for the, you know, 23 and a half hours plus a day when the Navy is not using uh, that radar, this spectrum is unusable by anyone else. And so the CBRS rules set up a, a priority structure where those incumbents with the, those national security uses and also, um, the operators of some satellites who have station, uh, stations on the ground to control those satellites, those two incumbent users are protected. Uh, but the uh, the CBRS band um, 
calls for the creation of this thing called a spectrum access system, a SAS. And you can think of that, it's a computer in the sky and it knows when the incumbent users are, want to use the spectrum. And when that happens, it basically tells everybody else who wants to use the spectrum, who's of a lower priority, that they have to be quiet while the Navy is looking for um, enemy vessels. So that's the incumbent tier. You have uh, the Navy and, and fixed earth stations. Uh, what we're talking about today is the next tier down. So these are priority access licenses. And these are gonna be awarded by competitive bidding to um, you know, different use cases, mobile, fixed wireless, enterprises, hotels, et cetera. We'll get to that. Um, and those will give you the right to broadcast in Spectrum and to be the exclusive user of Spectrum as long as the incumbents above you are not using it. And then the third tier of the system is gonna be general authorized access. Um, and so this is basically, it's not quite unlicensed, but it's very similar in that um, you're, you know, if we had a device in your home, a home router or some other product, um, it would also be talking to the Spectrum, Spectrum access system and it would know whether or not any priority access users or whether any of the incumbents were using that spectrum. And if not, you would be able to use this spectrum on an opportunistic basis. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'll make this a little easier to understand. So this is kind of how it works. At the top, you have the incumbents. So that, that's the, the military radars and the, the satellite earth stations. And they get first claim on spectrum if they want to use it. But again, they're not using it most of the time. And so we're creating a new tier, the priority access tier, and that's the tier we're really paying attention to today. Um, and those are gonna be, um, the, right, the, the right to use that spectrum is going to be auctioned off. And then you have the third tier, which uh, says that, you know, if the two prior users with higher priority aren't using the spectrum, just about anybody who complies with some basic rules and has equipment that talks to the SAS can use the spectrum. So. I apologize, this is a bit of a wonky discussion, but this, this structure here is a revolutionary paradigm in the way we allocate spectrum. If you think about it, spectrum is limited. We wanna make sure that we can have as many uses in it as possible. And this is a way of using you know, advancements in cloud computing and technology uh, to take a limited public resource and to get a whole lot more use out of it. Next slide. Yes, and it's also just worth noting that um, people may have broadband disruptions in Virginia if Canada attacks it. Right, so. which is okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but uh, the reason the reason that it's worth, I think, um, covering this um, is it's not just because it's really cool and interesting, but also um, in many ways we are hoping that this is um, um, the beginning of, of the way we use spectrum in the future in a much more phase is that um, particularly in communities that may be left behind by larger providers that are focused on adjacent bigger markets that that spectrum doesn't just lie fallow there but could be used by others um, to uh, build out in that market a uh, smaller market so Ellen did you want to add anything to this discussion yet yeah I, I'll just um, make a plug for also kind of non-traditional um, entrants who who can't afford um, spectrum licenses and and you know would never think to buy um, a, a massive license for um, existing spectrum so hospitals manufacturers um, campuses etc um, smart cities can neutral host connected venues what's so exciting for about the spectrum as, as I think both um, Chris and Jimmy were alluding to is it, it completely. That's it. Okay, uh, just real quick on the band plan. Um, I won't get into the details here, but uh, there's 150 megahertz of spectrum total in the CBRS band. And if you look down at the bottom, you'll see that um, uh, the most, there, there will be seven priority access licenses available pretty much everywhere in the country. And right now under the current plan, there will be at least 80 megahertz reserved for the unlicensed like uh, GAA tier. Um, and one other point here is that in the blue section, the top 50 megahertz of the band, there are already 
wireless ISPs using this top 50 megahertz of spectrum to provide broadband in uh, urban and rural markets. And a lot, of, um, a lot of those companies have made investments in equipment that currently only uses the blue portion of the spectrum. But the equipment they're buying and deploying has been designed so that as soon as the rules are finalized and as soon as that SaaS system I've talked about is certified and operational, with just a software change and no truck roll and no change of radio, um, those operators can deploy not just in the top 50 megahertz that are blue, but across the whole 150 megahertz. And that's one of the real impacts um, of a potential rule change on small businesses that, that we'll touch on soon. So let's go to the next slide. Now remember, we're talking mostly about the priority access licenses, that middle tier, the people who buy the exclusive right to use spectrum if the Navy radars or the military radars or the satellites aren't using it. And so under the current rules that were adopted unanimously in 2015 by the FCC, those PALs, the priority access licenses, are going to cover a geographic area of one census tract. And this is really a very dramatic break from the traditional model that we've deployed in the United States for the last many decades. Um, you know, traditionally, license spectrum is allocated over much, much larger geographic areas. Think, you know, half of a state. And that was because the primary user the FCC was tailoring the auctions to was the mobile phone model. And if you're a mobile phone operator, your customers are, by definition, moving around. So it made sense to acquire to allocate spectrum on the basis of these much larger areas. Um, by breaking with that model, uh, the FCC in 2015 has created the ability for wireless ISPs to invest in much um, more discrete and tailored areas. So, you know, a small business that may serve a rural part of Kansas can invest in the spectrum only in those areas where they know they have a need to connect additional customers. Um, it also has been alluded to, it's not only ISPs who have the ability to bid at the spectrum, but there's a whole host of other use cases that are now going to have access to licensed spectrum. So in rural America, that might be a large precision agriculture operation that needs a, a private LTE-based secure network to monitor soil conditions and, and determine how much fertilizer and other chemicals to deploy. Um, you could have a location like a racetrack um, that wants to set up uh, what a what many of you would think of as um, a very, very, very robust LTE-based uh, Wi-Fi network, even though it wouldn't be Wi-Fi, it's LTE, but um, so that anybody in their racetrack could get online uh, and instead of using their mobile data could offload uh, to the local network and, um, you know, have a great experience and send photos of what they're doing and videos of the race to their friends. Other users are, you know, a school, a community college campus, a high school campus might want to set this up and have this license protected spectrum. Hospitals, another key use case, you know, increasingly medical equipment is connected to the cloud and wirelessly in hospitals and have a very um, pressing need for, you know, safe, secure LTE based um, license spectrum. And, and there are dozens of other uses, uh, you know, libraries, refineries, uh, seaports, um, there there are just more potential new uses than you can imagine who uh, can put spectrum to use in very productive ways if they can acquire it on the basis of these small geographic areas. Um, in addition to the geographic area, the term of, of the CBRS rules is also pretty innovative. You know, traditionally, um, uh, in America, we have done uh, large area licenses that are auctioned off on 10 year terms. And they essentially, um, whoever buys it the first time around has got a de facto perpetual license in that spectrum. Um, the CBRS rules break with that paradigm and under the current rules, the buyer would get a, an initial three year term and then have the right to buy one additional three year term. So they could guarantee six years up front, but after that, the spectrum would have to be auctioned again. And the idea here is that uh, you don't want to put the limited public airwaves into the hands of folks who are just going to sit on them. You want to make sure they're in the hands of end users who are going to put the spectrum to productive use. Uh, and then remember, because of the three-tier system, um, if you're not using this, if you hold a PAL and you're not using it, everyone else can use that spectrum on a GAA basis. You know, Jimmy, 
the uh, the three years that seems like um, is that a pretty reasonable time period given the lifetime of equipment and things like that for payoff? You know, this is an area where um, there are a lot of different opinions. Um, our national association would be comfortable with taking this to a little bit longer. Uh, we, we've stated in the record that we think of five years with one five-year renewal term, so you could guarantee 10 up front. That would be enough. Uh, it is true that three years is a little short depending on, uh, you know, for the, for the rural broadband business case. Um, you know, it takes us six months to a year to get permissions and deploy, um, which really gives you just a two-year payback period or, or four-year payback period. Um, so, one of the areas of consensus uh, could be making these terms a little bit longer, but the key, um, I think, from our perspective and, and many others, is that this spectrum should not be auctioned off in a way that that makes it effectively a perpetual license. There needs to be some market check on an ongoing basis to make sure that the spectrum is in the hands of someone who's not only has an economic incentive to use it, but is also using it. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we're about to get into the proposed changes. Um, and uh, Ellen, I want to make sure that you had a chance to sort of throw anything else into the mix that you wanted. I know that you have more stuff to say at the end, but I just thought I'd give you another chance here. No, I appreciate that, Chris. I think Jimmy has has summarized not only the feelings of um, his uh, company and, and with like um, his, but there are and as Jimmy will get into, I think um, the majority of commenters on the record and the majority of folks in um, the industry and potential customers agree uh, that that smaller is better and this, the expectation of renewal, um, you know, turning into a, a de facto perpetual license in perpetuity is not, uh, is not where we need to be for innovation. Great. Go ahead, Jimmy. And I think we could probably skip two slides ahead, but I'll let you drive, Jimmy. <laughs> yep. So as we mentioned uh, last October, in response to some petitions filed by the mobile industry, the FCC released a, a regulatory action, a notice of proposed rulemaking, to consider changes to the current rules. There are a number of changes in there, uh, some of which are technical and not controversial, but there are two very important ones that are the subject um, of what we're going to talk about here. And remember again, we're talking about that middle slice of spectrum, the middle of the triangle uh, for the, the priority access licenses. So the FCC's NPRM, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, um, has asked for comments on increasing the size of these of the geographic area from census tracts to what are called partial economic areas. Uh, these are very, very large areas and, and we've got some maps we'll show you, but uh, there are basically 416 of them in the U.S. as opposed to 74,000 census tracts. And um, uh, the FCC also invited comments on a number of uh, other proposals, so looking at PEAs and counties and hybrid approaches. Um, but the, the fundamental issue here is that, you know, any geographic unit that's larger than a census tract, you really begin to make the spectrum much less useful for anyone except for uh, the large incumbent mobile carriers. Uh, and we're moving away from the innovative approach that allows people, uh, all kinds of end users to acquire spectrum and back towards one where, you know, the au auction rules and the lot size at the auction really stack the deck in favor of one use case. Uh, the other major issue that is a potential rule change um, uh, that's proposed in the NPRM is increasing from the current term, which remember is three years with one three-year renewal opportunity, to a full 10-year term with essentially a perpetual expectation of renewal. Um, uh, the FCC proposed a 10-year term and invited comments on other proposals. Um, uh, but the, the main thing here is that not only does this extend the term and thus make the spectrum much more expensive for all users up front, but it also means that this is a one and done, this will be the only shot uh, in anyone on, on this webinar's lifetime to uh, impact the rules about what happens with this critical Goldilocks mid-band spectrum. And Jimmy, I'm just I'm curious. I mean, one of the things that I always worry about with spectrum is um, 
is how the big players use it, not just necessarily to offer better services, but to foreclose competition. Given all of their spectrum holdings, is there a case that that there's just no need to bend the rules in their favor even more so to give you a softball? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I mean, absolutely, and we'll we'll touch on this pretty much most of the slides for the for the rest of the presentation. But you know, the the what's going on here? Let's be plain: is that the the mobile interests are trying to change the rules so that the rules favor their use case and it will make it easier for them to acquire and warehouse additional public spectrum uh, in a way that really doesn't have any corresponding public policy benefits. Um, and that's why it's so important that the FCC hear not only from uh, the wireless ISP industry and folks like GE and Sony and uh, the myriad of other uses who are talking, but but directly from um, cities and municipalities about the importance of the spectrum um, and about getting this right because it's it's a once and done shot and we need to have uh, more attention on what's being proposed here and, and what the real world implications are going to be for for cities throughout America and, and in particular rural America. And let me remind people if you have any questions you can drop them in the chat box. Uh, if you are not on chat if you're on the phone and you want to um, text or probably easier to email me, uh, Christopher at ILSR or CAT, um, ILSR.org, um, or CAT, or your questions, we'll get them in. So uh, any questions, please just reach out to us any way you can. All right, so go let's ahead. go to the next slide, talking more about the, the what the mobile industry has stated about what they want to do with CBRS. Um, the comments that have been filed by the mobile carriers in the record make clear that their primary use for this spectrum is to provide additional capacity on their existing networks and urban areas. So think about, you know, they want to make sure that um, if you're walking down the street in New York City or Washington, D.C., that they have enough spectrum on their network to make sure that you can stream a YouTube video without it buffering. And that is a very legitimate need. No one disagrees with that. Um, but that use alone is not going to result in connecting the 23 million rural Americans who don't have broadband today. And another very important part uh, to bear in mind is that nothing in the current rules prevents a mobile carrier from bidding on and acquiring every single census tract they want. But the reverse is not true, meaning, you know, someone who does not have uh, a business case that requires license spectrum over a large geographic area they are going to be priced out of the auction. Um, and what the mobile carriers are talking about doing with the spectrum in order to provide that capacity in urban areas is deploying uh, something called small cells that you've probably heard a lot about. Um, these are very expensive. They are used for uh, providing additional capacity and densification in urban areas. Um, uh, and as someone uh, likes to say, you know, it's just it. 5G small cells are not going to be deployed anytime soon to rural areas that don't have any G right now. A, a place that does not have broadband available to its residents is almost by definition not an area where there's going to be a, an economic incentive for a mobile carrier to deploy a mobile small cell. Um, and one thing in the in the comments that had been filed was that one of the carriers, T-Mobile, um, proposed that uh, the acquirers of the spectrum would have an obligation to build out and use that spectrum sufficient to cover 40% of the population in a PEA. Well, and if you look at that, um, the build out requirement that would be required to connect 40% of the population in PEA number one, which covers New York City, you could do that by deploying small cells over just 1.63% of the land area. So you'll see there, uh, the same, same trend happens in LA, 1.12% of the land area contains 40% of the population. Chicago, 4.5% of the land area contains 40% of the population. And you skip to the uh, further down to pick Daytona. Again, 4.5% of the population of the land area contains 40% of the population. So what that shows you is, again, what I said above, it, it's very clear from the record that the mobile carriers are interested in this for covering densely populated areas. They're not interested in using it to deploy in rural America. And the argument we're making is that, you know, uh, we have a, a, a system of rules right now that would allow the mobile carriers to acquire the spectrum that they're interested in urban areas, but that also won't 
preclude other users from acquiring spectrum in other areas. So Jimmy, let me just interrupt and um, this is Ellen and say, you know, it is one of those rare instances where we can actually have it all. Um, the, the current rules enable both the, you know, existing wireless companies, existing large wireless nationwide wireless carriers to, you know, build build capacity for their networks, but then also a tremendous level of activity and investment from a, a brand new wide variety of participants. Um, so I don't think that we can last, gloss over that particular point. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, that's exactly right. So let's go uh, to the next slide, which kind of summarizes the arguments that have been made on either side. So uh, if you look through the record at the FCC, what, what are some things that the mobile industry is saying and, and um, how do we respond to that? But, uh, one argument that's made is that uh, the, the CBRS spectrum needs to be tailor-made for the mobile industry in order to facilitate U.S. leadership in 5G deployments. And um, cities, towns, wireless ISPs, um, industrial manufacturers, uh, and others are all pointing out that, you know, well, the, the band plan is already at the forefront of global uh, spectrum policy, and there's been a massive amount of investment already in the basis of the, on the basis of the rules that were adopted unanimously in 2015. Uh, turning to the, the license size, the mobile industry will say that they um, need larger areas so that they can um, justify making investment. Um, everyone else is saying, well, um, you know, that only benefits the mobile use case, the detriment of all others. And, and uh, by the way, the current rules would allow anyone to acquire whatever they want. Um, and they just have to bid at auction and acquire the spectrum. Um, the last point there I want to touch on that has been stated is, um, you know, a, a remedy from switching from small census tracts to much larger areas such as PEAs is, is, is to make it easier for mobile carriers to, you know, partition and disaggregate their spectrum and sell it in the secondary markets. Um, and uh, the uniform response of almost all other commenters has been that if, if you look over history, this really doesn't happen. There are there's lots of examples of um, the big four mobile carriers swapping spectrum amongst themselves, but there are very, very few examples of the big four making unused spectrum available um, outside of the group of, uh, of the big four. If you go to the next slide, um, we'll really drive home the impact of this rule change on rural America. There we go. Next slide. Okay. All right. So this is uh, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, an area that I'm familiar with, and um, the blue lines on the map here, these are the boundaries of the PEAs, the partial economic areas. Um, and the shaded areas that are kind of that orange color, those are areas that according to the FCC's most recent map are not served with uh, broadband that is 10 down, one up. Um, and, and those are actually areas where later this year, the FCC is going to be making subsidies available for carriers to build into. So. If we, we talked earlier about how important this mid-band spectrum is for rural broadband, because it, it has enough data but can still get through some trees, um, and, and the fixed wireless technology that we use is the most cost-effective way of connecting rural America, well, you see that um, these unserved areas are not neatly contained in the middle of partial economic areas. In fact, quite the opposite, the unserved areas are usually straddling PEA lines. So if you look down at that, that arrow, um, actually, just above where the red arrow hits the map, if, if uh, a small or a regional broadband company wanted to go into that large unserved pocket there and they wanted to use mid-band spectrum to get through the trees and connect customers, they wouldn't just buy one PEA, but they'd have to buy one, two, three, four, five, six PEAs, even though they were just interested in serving a small portion of each of those six PEAs. Uh, next slide. Uh, this map zooms in a little bit on that area. Um, and you can see, again, the blue lines here are the PEA boundaries. The shaded areas are the unserved areas, according to the FCC. And those light green lines are the census tracts. And you'll see what a difference it makes if, if you wanted to deploy 
and and connect all of uh, all of those census tracts that are unserved uh, near the arrow, you're able to do that as a broadband provider much more efficiently if you can just acquire the spectrum in the specific tracts that you need. Whereas, you know, if we switch to PEAs, in order to uh, connect uh, the area there around Lovingston, you see, I think that's Nelson County, Virginia, you would not only have to acquire the spectrum in that county and, and in those census tracts, but you'd also have to acquire the spectrum in downtown Charlottesville, where there's probably a, a better user for that spectrum, namely um, offloading of, of mobile traffic. And this story really repeats itself um, throughout the country. So next slide. Um, so let's talk a second about, you know, what the impact of this potential change on small businesses, um, you know, as hopefully you've seen by now, by changing the lot size, um, the FCC would effectively shut small businesses and new entrants and, and innovators out of the only auction for mid-band spectrum that's uh, going to occur in the foreseeable future. Uh, you also have uh, very significant investments that have already been made in reliance on the rules that were unanimously adopted in 2015. Uh, the Wireless ISP Association, of which uh, I'm on the board of directors, conducted a survey of our members, uh, and 63% of the respondents from that survey indicated that they had already invested and made uh, deployments in rural America based on the rules that were adopted in 2015, and 60% indicated that they had already curtailed their investment in new equipment because of the threat uh, of these potential rule changes. And you know, stepping back a little bit from that. Yeah, um, it's healthy, it's important in our democracy that we have a, a large number of uh, providers and competition and in providing information uh, and the potential rule changes at the FCC are, are really going to further entrench the current dominance of the big four mobile carriers, um, you know, through a regulatory change that they requested. Turning to rural America, um, not only from the private provider side, but uh, on the impact on uh, underserved Americans. You know, these rule changes are really going to discourage private capital from being invested to connect rural America because it's very difficult to make a business case to acquire a license spectrum if you have to acquire a license that covers 10 or 20 times the, the size of where you want to use it. Um, this, we would be losing a once in a generation opportunity to uh, allocate some mid band spectrum in a way that can be used to connect the 23 million rural Americans who can't get on the internet today. Um, and we would also foreclose all of those innovative uses uh, in rural America. So whether that's, you know, you wanted to have an excellent uh, neutral host um, public internet system on your main street uh, for your community college, for operating uh, large agribusinesses in your community, uh, for your stadium or ballpark, uh, all of those uses will be foreclosed. Turning to urban areas, go ahead to the next slide. Um, you know, I, I've talked a lot about um, rural, but there's a whole lot of very important use cases in urban areas that are uh, very important. Um, am I taking the slide, or does someone else want to walk through this? Jimmy, I'll, I'll walk through it, and I think you've done an excellent job of, and through our interplay earlier in. Um, the, the webinar, but just to point out, innovation investment is already happening. There are 200 plus experimental authorizations um, that the FCC has granted in this band since the 2015 order, um, which include, and in those experimental authorizations, are both traditional and non-traditional use cases. So you'll see, you see there are comments by GE, who is a um, massive supporter and very interested in the industrial IoT, obviously for um, manufacturing and for some of their operations. But um, in addition, there is the CBRS Alliance, which is, um, I think it's up to 60 companies, upwards of 60 companies. It was, it was 50 in August and they've grown. Um, they just keep adding members. But these are everywhere from, um, or everyone from, major multinational companies like GE, um, Alphabet, and Google to uh, startups and and, and venture capitalists and, and WISPs. 
banks and other small businesses, um, major equipment vendors, et cetera, who have been hard at work um, on these LTE-based solutions on industrial IoT, and then also um, really bringing their potential customers to the table, and that includes um, entities like the Port of LA or Union Pacific or um, other other railroads and and hospi the hospitality industry, who are all interested in the kind of connectivity that this can provide. Um, the CBRS and and the rules as envisioned in 2015 um, could provide. And you know, I will just um, point out, Jimmy. I think you you mentioned earlier the comment about flexibility um, and the flexibility to acquire or use additional spectrum. Um, economists, including the, the other quote you all will see there is, um, the professor who designed the last two auctions at the FCC, who is in um, private practice, if economists practice, uh, at, at Stanford, um, who, who has submitted a study to the record um, Essentially saying, here's how you would do the auction. Here's, you know, here's what's interesting about it. This is the forefront of auction theory, and it would make us a leader in the world and in 5G. Um, so, not to, I know I sound like, oh, this could, this is Goldilocks spectrum, as Jimmy said, and this could solve all of our problems. But I think the opportunities for both rural and urban areas um, are are very interesting. Yeah, I think if we go to the next page here, you'll really see some some maps that are going to make that more concrete. So um, these are some images that Google put in the record uh, in favor of maintaining the current rules. So you'll see on the left there, um, that little rainbow circle, that's the, the theoretical propagation um, of a radio broadcasting at Texas Motor Speedway in Dallas. Uh, and you'll see the green area there is the census tract, which is the um, that contains Texas Motor Speedway. And so under the current rules, if Texas Motor Speedway wanted to set up a really high qual quality wireless network for its patrons, uh, it could acquire the spectrum in that green census tract uh, and then you know, invest in an excellent wireless experience for the customers. Um, if you look at the right, you'll see the, the same green census tract and how it fits into the much larger red area, which is the PEA. And so if you think about it, um, if Texas Motor Speedway just had to acquire the license in that green area, you know, that makes sense. And if they were the highest and best user of the spectrum, you would expect them to bid for and win the spectrum. But even if in that green area, they were the highest and best user of the spectrum, you can't possibly expect that they're gonna be able to bid for and acquire license spectrum if they have to buy the whole red area because they have no use for it. Um, let's go to the next slide. This is the same thing. Um, another application we've talked a lot uh, of, about is healthcare. And so if you think, you know, this is um, what the propagation from an indoor access point, uh, meaning a wireless broadcast location inside the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, New York would look like. And you'll see it, it kind of straddles two census tracts there. And so, you know, the Mayo Clinic uh, has a very legitimate need and probably interest in acquiring licensed spectrum so they could have a safe wireless network to operate their business and for guests and patients. And if they just had to acquire two census tracts, it would probably make a lot of economic sense and, and they would certainly be able to bid and offer a competitive bid at auction. But if they had to acquire the entire PEA, which is the red square on figure four on the right, again, there's just no possible way that they can be a competitive bidder at the auction because their use case only calls for using a very small slice of that spectrum, which is the, the area in green. So just to reiterate, Jimmy, because I'm coming in with um, colorful anecdotes, it's uh, uh, as though you, you want to buy a kiosk and you have to buy the whole mall to have access to the kiosk. Yes. I haven't heard that one, and that's great. That's good. <laughs> so the next slide is how we can help. We'll get to that. And Ellen, I think you're going to take it away. I think that's it. Um, so if I hadn't, if you didn't hear me before and you haven't heard me several times, we have a letter um, that we're circulating and there's a, a fairly short time frame because these things 
of course that's how these things happen. Um, but the letter is available at um, the, the URL that you see on your screen, or if you're on the phone, it's a bit.ly link, B-I-T dot L-Y slash C-B-R-S city. And um, Kat and Deb and Chris have sent the, the letter around as well. The other thing that could be useful if you have time um, and if you have the inclination, the reply comment deadline at the FCC is Monday, Monday at midnight. And um, as I mentioned before, the F we think it's really valuable for the FCC to hear um, how this could impact or how uh, we believe it could impact um, folks around the country. And you don't need to invest much time in submitting a short comment or letter to the FCC. And um, I will send, I should have put the docket number on this slide, and I am so sorry I was remiss in doing that, but I'll send to Kat and Chris, and, and they can include. Um, so those are your, oh, the docket number is 17-258. So those are the asks, and if you have any questions, Chris, I'm, I'm sure um, someone will be able to answer them, but I'm always happy to talk more about CBRS or, or find someone to talk to. Yes, we do have a couple of minutes still for anyone if they want to ask any questions. Um, one question that I just came up with is, um, do we have any sense of when this will be resolved? Is there any sort of a logical timetable? Um, so, oh, sorry, Jimmy. I, I, I'll give my conjecture, and then you can give yours. How do you okay, say like yeah. that? Um, probably the second quarter. I mean, the, the commission. Um, so, the two commissioners, the commissioner and the the chairman, with the most poll, have indicated um, that they'd like to resolve this quickly, which I think is great. Um, could have been resolved a lot earlier, but um, so I think the second quarter for sure. Jimmy? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the comment period is going to close uh, next week, and the uh, the commissioner who is uh, has the lead on this item is Commissioner O'Reilly, and, and uh, you know, he's a very thorough and actually reads everything that is filed in the record, so your comments will matter. Um, you know, I would expect that the SCC is going to uh, take an appropriate amount of time, uh, maybe a month or so, to review the record and come up with a decision. But there also, um, you know, there's a broad consensus from within the FCC and uh, from across industry that we need to get this spectrum into commercial use as soon as possible. So, you know, hopefully we'll see action on this during the second quarter. All right. Kat, did you have any questions come in? I have not received any. But if anyone does have a question and they haven't submitted it yet, please feel free to do so in the chat box, or this would probably be an appropriate time to unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, we'll just give a second for anyone who wants to unmute themselves, ask a question. Well, I think um, Jimmy did a very good job covering it um, in terms of explaining it in a, in a very, um, accessible manner. I very much appreciate spelling out most of the acronyms uh, multiple times. That's always very helpful. Um, so let me uh, thank you and Ellen. Thank you both for coming to bring this to us and let's encourage our members to take some action on it. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. And this uh, will be later today. Okay. okay. All right, thanks so much to Chris, Ellen, and to me for sharing all your knowledge on this uh, but important topic. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Bye, everyone.